out of all the people in all the countries, in all the world, in all of the galaxy, in all of the universe, it's likely safe to say that one man and his organization have done more research into blockchain technology than anyone else. That man is Don Tapscott and his Blockchain Research Institute. It's a pretty big claim and might offend the aliens of Zerplatz. They might lay claim to having pursued blockchain millions of years before we did. But screw those guys. They're 10 gazillion light years away and won't hear the show until long after we're all dead and gone. Besides, Zerplatzians are prone to hysteria. Don, however, is not. The depth of his knowledge into the technology that we're banking on for the future is unsurpassed. And on today's show, we get to probe his brain to discover that which we do not know. So join us as we tap Don Tapscott's mind for all things blockchain on episode number 405 of the Bad Crypto Podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, two, ignition. Who's that? Uh, hey, Mr. Joel Kahn, make sure you get consent before you probe any areas of any of our guests. <laughs> before we tap that? Yeah. Well, let's see. On the last episode, we had Akon, and we smacked that. And on this episode, we're, we got Don Tapscott, and we're going to tap that. And probe that. Sounds and good. I guess we got all kinds of... We got all kinds it's of- okay, Don. Don't worry about it. We're not going to probe anyone. <laughs> 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 Welcome to the Bad Crypto Podcast. The Tap Crypto Podcast, and I'm Joel Kahn, that's Travis Wright, and we're here for you. This is episode number 405, and if you missed Don Tapscott's keynote, the closing keynote of Virtual Blockchain Week, then make sure you go back to the YouTube channel on Bad Crypto and watch that, or go to virtualblockchainweek.com and go to the watch page. But this today is a little different discussion. This was actually the discussion that we had that convinced him to come on and be part of Virtual Blockchain Week. And I think with this conversation with him, then he went out and then he built the most amazing presentation to end the conference in. What was it, like 50 some odd slides? It, it was it, more than that. It was a 50 minute. It was supposed to be a 30 minute keynote. And he just ran with him like, damn, you go as long as you want, you know, sir, because because what you're bringing is gold. Yeah, it took go, a- go to our YouTube channel. Go to just go to YouTube. Type in Bad Crypto. You'll see our channel. If you're not subscribed already, go ahead and do that. We just passed 3,000 subscriptions, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you consider like 18 months of that, we didn't even have our YouTube channel because it had been taken away. So we've never really done any pushes towards that. But go to YouTube, subscribe, and then and then type and then type in Don Tabscott Bad Crypto or Virtual Blockchain Week Don Tabscott uh, State of the Blockchain Union or something along those lines and find it it's it's well worth sitting there and going through all those slides because he really brings the thunder and it was two and a half years more than two and a half years he was on our wish list and finally you know we got him to come do this interview and then you're right he enjoyed it so much like we just asked him at the end of the interview do you want to do do the closing keynote i was like hell yeah and now he won't stop calling he's like you know he's calling me every day he's like what no he's not but he's like, uh, where's that get- probe <laughs> <laughs> well, let's probe into one of our sponsors here, MobiPay. ProbiPay. I-O. Yeah. Do you want to talk about them? Pro- ProbiPay? Proby. ProbiMay. <laughs> you get tokens for being probed. <laughs> <laughs> hook, hook the sensors up to your brain. You got to get the Elon sensor they, Neuralink going. As they probe your thoughts, you earn cryptocurrency. That's great. Yeah, MobiPay, the universal payment ecosystem Let's consumers make secure fiat and digital cryptocurrency payments worldwide from their mobile phone in seconds. An integrated reward and payment token, MobiCoin, connects fiat and digital currencies directly to a global marketplace. Retail marketplace, you can do all kinds of stuff, cash back on purchases, lots of other things. So everyone in the Mobi ecosystem gets rewarded. Go to MobiPay, M-O-B-I-E, pay.io, I-O, 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 and get you some crypto. (laughs) <laughs> 10 bucks of npx <laughs> not bad not bad mr travis right you were inspired from our interview with akon that was like the the white man's rap right there was that was <laughs> yeah that, that was good I O so off to work i go yeah so stick around after the interview as well because the having just happened yesterday and we want to talk about that as well but right now let's get into the meat of the matter with mr don tapscott 
And we're pleased to have with us today Don Tapscott, the chairman and co-founder of the Blockchain Research Institute. Don, welcome to Bad Crypto. Hey, great to be here, as it were. We're uh, we're glad to finally have you here and overcome technology issues. You know, here we are in 2020 and everybody is at home and they're using video conferencing. I would imagine there's a lot of people that have never used, you know, a Zoom before that are now addicted to it. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. I think uh, the, there'll be a lot of permanent changes, actually, in our behavior as a result of all of this. Let's go right down that rabbit hole, then, and let's just begin with your initial thoughts. You know, I want to timestamp this. It's April 23rd when we're recording this. This is going to air uh, in a couple weeks or so, but this is kind of the state of the union right now. Uh, what, do you, what do you see changing? Uh, well, for sure, uh, you know, permanent, permanent changes. Um, I think that uh, there are a lot of unknowns, and uh, we don't even know how deep and bad this economic crisis is going to be, and it's hard to calculate the the human uh, crisis. But I, some real obvious ones in my mind, I think online shopping is going to become ascendant, and uh, there uh, many retail corporations are closing. Some jurisdictions are ordering the closing of an outlet that isn't selling food in a central uh, home or medical supplies. So we're all online shopping and we're getting kind of used to it. I think uh, we'll see the end of cash, notwithstanding China's efforts to implement a, f a fiat cryptocurrency. Now we've got, in, on top of all of the disadvantages of the traditional cash and payment system, we've got the fact that cash is dirty. Um, that's stimulating a lot of thinking and, uh, and action. And uh, we can talk about that later if you want. I think we're, we're going to see the comeback of global institutions. After the Second World War, uh, nations built all kinds of global institutions, started Bretton Woods in 1944. We created the IMF and the World Bank. And then uh, a year later, the UN and uh, the World Trade Organization, the WHO. You think now all these international organizations are really quite critical um, I think that we're going to see a bunch of other changes. Online education, we've noticed we've got a big co a set of courses through Coursera on blockchain, uh, blockchain in the enterprise, in partnership with INSEAD, the business school outside of Paris. You know, this is an idea whose uh, time has finally come, online education, and, and that course is exploding right now. I'll tell you a funny story, and I'm dating myself here, but 1976, I was doing a graduate degree, and I was taking a, a graduate course in statistics. The entire course was online in 1976. These were huh. terminals connected to the data center at the university. And I went at my own pace, uh, went over things I didn't understand. I remember thinking, uh, you know, if someone saw me going over this again, they'd think I was really dumb. But I, but I kept going over it, and I got it. Eventually, I got like an, an A, and I ended up with a full scholarship because of that experience. And um, there were no lectures, but let's face it, <laughs> the statistics lectures, def <laughs> by definition, a bust. There's no one-size-fits-all for statistics. Everyone in the classroom is either bored or they don't get it. Uh, but, um, you know, now we've got Nothing so powerful as an idea who's become an imperative, to paraphrase uh, Victor Hugo. And I think that we're going to see a big rise in online learning. I think we'll, we'll become a society of uh, clean freaks. Uh, personal hygiene and sanitation is on, on the top of mind for, uh, for everyone. I think there'll be a destigmatization of government. It doesn't mean it'll overcome the crisis of legitimacy that exists of our democratic institutions. But the idea of government per se, remember Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, uh, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Well, I think libertarianism as an ideology right now is in deep trouble because, you know, in the U.S., people are looking for the uh, looking at the CDC for up-to-date information, the Food and Drug Administration uh, for information on vaccine, Army Corps of Engineers to, you know, set up hospital facilities, Congress for financial re relief, the, you know, the, the Federal Reserve to, um, to try and uh, affect the inevitable recession and so on. People will understand that there is, in fact, a rule. 
uh, for government. There are, there are a bunch of things. The virtual workplace is um, is pretty much a no brainer now. And uh, I think business travel also is going to suffer. Are we going to get on airplanes again so readily? And um, there's sort of a PTSD in some ways that uh, comes from all of this. Um, I think we'll, we're going to have to get serious about basic income. And um, this is before, you know, Andrew Yang and the Democratic primaries popularized the idea. But I've been arguing for this for a long time. Um, and, and not b because of, of the pandemic, but you look at things like autonomous vehicles, 48 of the 50, uh, 50 states in the U.S., the number one job type is driver, truck driver. And I think that's gone in a decade, not in, you know, 50 years. So, um, and, and the idea that governments are basically providing a, a universal basic income right now in most countries. So, um, again, the, the, the pandemic has stimulated a reflection, if you like, or, or worse, the crisis in a lot of these institutions that exist, and we're going to have to rethink them. You, there's a there's a lot there to unwrap. We, we've covered a whole lot of different things. I want to maybe take a step back. And whenever I first heard of you was with your book, Wikinomics. And uh, I remember reading that book really early on and talking about how, you know, mass collaboration really charges, sort of changes everything. So here you were in 2006, 2007, talking about collaboration, talking about sort of you know the econ the gig economy, kind of how how things are gonna gonna happen. So you kind of you kind of saw where the road was going. So it seemed like you you know with, with how everybody was on Wikipedia and they were all collaborating on that, and then now then you get Uber and and now you Instacart and some of the other stuff that uh, that that the sort of happened as a result of collaboration and and sort of the 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 crowd being able to sort of work like. Maybe maybe take us into the future. Do you have a, a, a crystal ball in in sort of you know collaboration and crowdfunding or not crowdfunding but just crowdsourcing of things like like we're entering this new era now that that maybe most people aren't even aren't, aren't prepared for right we're in they're entering this time where we've got this really scary virus and people are afraid of touching people and going and so it is it's it's changing a whole lot but it's still available. There's still opportunities out there for folks who are, you know, doing some of this crowdsourcing type of stuff. So maybe what, what do you think from what you've researched and, and what you wrote about Wikinomics, how does that apply to maybe the next five years or so? Yeah. Uh, Wikinomics was actually my 12th book. <laughs> um, I wrote a couple of books in the 1980s that nobody read. I think my mother bought most of the <laughs> copies, but, um, and then, uh, but I, I, I wrote my first bestsellers in the early 90s, uh, Paradigm Shift, which is obviously a big book, in 93 and uh, 94, 95, The Digital Economy, which was the first bestseller about the web and business. Um, but, you know, uh, people call me a futurist, but I'm not really. Um, I'm, I'm of the view that the future is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. Now, I will confess uh, to be guilty of having some views on what a desired future is, for sure. And that's what Wikonomics described. It described a bunch of profound changes that were enabled by the Internet that could create a whole bunch of things. And um, in hindsight, that turned out to be um, valid. But going forward from here, I mean, let me just step back for a sec. You know, Wikonomics... And all of those books, actually, were about the Internet, which we've had for 40 years. And again, I'm dating myself. It was the late 70s when I was at Canada's Bell Labs. And we had this crazy view that everybody was going to use a computer. Back then, the only people who used computers were programmers. And uh, so we uh, essentially built Microsoft Office on a dumb terminal in 1977 using uh, Unix. And uh, we did controlled experiments back then, 50 people using all of these capabilities that we have today, you know, email document management, uh, time management, calendaring, um, you know, financial planning, uh, computer conferencing, all the rest. And the people who had the computer performed better. And they also uh, worked differently. They communicated differently. So we said uh, computers are going to become a communications tool. Of course, they did. 
But um, flash forward to today, that internet was the internet of information. And um, if I send you, you know, if you send a file, you know, an MP3 or whatever of this podcast, or, you know, I send you a PowerPoint or an email or whatever, I'm actually not sending you the information. I'm sending you a copy. And that works great for information. But, you know, even with a website, you retain the original. But when it comes to the things that really matter in the economy going forward, things of value, assets, could be information that is of value and belongs to somebody, but other assets like money or securities or intellectual property or contracts or deeds or the data in our identities or cultural assets like art or music or votes, a votes and assets, something of value that belongs to somebody. When it comes to those things, copying them is a bad idea. And you don't want co uh, someone copying your identity or your vote. And if I send you $1,000, it's really important that I don't still have the money. So this some is some people I, don't have a problem copying the vote. So you know, it depends uh, how desperate you are <laughs> in the election. Yeah, well, and um, we can go there if you want. There's a real crisis of legitimacy of our democratic institutions. I, I would like you to go there. Let's let's talk <laughs> about that because you know there's questions out there whether voter fraud is a real problem or not, and bringing voting to the blockchain could help to solve the problem if it did exist. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think, and our research shows that in most Western countries, there is a real problem of voter fraud. There is a perceived problem of people who don't like the results of elections that say there's been a problem. Now, of course, in lots of developing countries and in um, totalitarian countries, this is a massive problem. But in the West, there is a crisis of legitimacy. I mean, young people aren't voting. A lot of them agree with the bumper sticker, don't vote, it only encourages them. And, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but it's not really, because what are the alternatives to democracy? You've got, you know, basically the basic problem is that our elected representatives aren't accountable to citizens. They're accountable to the people who funded their campaign. So, and and what I'm about to say is not a political statement, it's just a fact that in the U.S., 94 percent of the of the the population and survey after survey favor background checks for firearm purchases. But Congress can't pass a law reflecting the will of 94 percent of the people because they're not accountable to people; they're accountable to the the big um, lobbyists that put them there, including the NRA. So you know, from the government for the people, by the people, of the people. This is risible. So, and then you have a president, the U.S., who says uh, democracy is illegitimate. There's massive voter fraud, he says. There's no real evidence of that. And, and also, uh, he says the system is corrupt. The center of American democracy is a, is a swamp and a cesspool. So um, it's no wonder that a lot of people are, are, are questioning the system. Now, legitimacy is the idea that you may disagree with who's in power, but at least you think the system is the best one. There are a lot of people wondering now. They look to China and they see great economic gains. They they get involved in all kinds of fundamentalist things, not just jihadists, but you know Christian stuff. Maybe we should have a strong man uh, government. Maybe we should have li a libertarian government or anarchy or. Good Lord, Vladimir Putin wants to bring back the Soviet Union. Maybe that was something that worked. So blockchain can, can make a real difference here in a bunch of ways. And we've done a lot of work on this. It's publicly available on the Blockchain Research Institute uh, site. And for sure, through um, uh, ha having legitimate online elections, I don't think most people are going to vote online unless they know the, the double spend problem has been uh, ma managed. And that's what Satoshi cracked in 2008. And that's why we can have an internet of value now, where value can be managed, stored, transacted, you know, counted in a secure and private way. And with blockchain, you know, you want to you have cryptographic proof that your vote was cast for the person for whom you're voting. 
and it wasn't moved to somebody else or double mm-hmm. counted or uncounted. Or, and it's only this technology that can do that. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you can have smart votes. You have smart money. Send your kid off to college and uh, you hope that he uses the money on, on books and tuition. Well, with smart money in a, inside a smart contract, he goes into the bar, orders a mojito, and the, the money says, sorry, I don't do mojitos. You know, I only do books and tuition. Well, why couldn't you have a smart vote? Well, you're not just voting for a politician. You're voting for their program. And if they don't implement their program, there are consequences. There are a lot of cool things that are underway. Oh, that would be awesome. I mean, you know, because that's one of the things like I remember in 2016, my voting precinct was using the same voting machines that they were using like in 2004. Right. And it's and it was proven that those votes, those voting machines can be hacked with a computer who can connect to the Wi-Fi. Right. I'm like, so that so to me, that is like that just doesn't seem safe. And then I leave and I don't I don't get a receipt for my vote. I can't go online and check to see that my vote was accounted right yeah. so i don't i don't necessarily think it has to be online but it sure would be handy if you could go and vote and then your vote goes to the blockchain you get a receipt that has that transaction id and you can go and check that it's validated for the votes that i intended them to do that yeah. would be something i think that would maybe appease both sides of the fence right it doesn't matter if you're a liberal or if you're a conservative you just want to know that you're being heard and both sides in a lot of ways think the other side's cheating right well, I agree with everything you said. A little nuance on the last point, though, is sometimes people don't like the way uh, a population votes, and they want to cast um, um, doubt on it. And that's the powerful thing about a blockchain-based system is they wouldn't be able to do that. That's true. Absolutely. You know, the blockchain is unhackable. Now, if people see these media stories about exchanges losing money or people you know losing their bitcoin but a lot of people don't understand that doesn't mean the blockchain's been hacked it means human error you know a website's been hacked somebody left their password out you know where somebody could find it i uh, has there yet been a case of a real blockchain hack to your knowledge not of a not of any kind of major blockchain now, I got in a lot of trouble for this. From, I don't know if you guys saw that. John Oliver on um, the, the yeah, I was going to ask you about the chicken nuggets reference. What was that yeah. all about? Well, <laughs> you know, I well, you saw my TED talk, and I describe how a blockchain works. And uh, it took me three years to be able to say that in three minutes. But... Um, and then I added after the TED talk was over that that a blockchain is is very difficult to hack because it's such a highly processed thing. And the analogy I used was it's sort of like a chicken McNugget. It's very processed, you know. It's sort of be like trying to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now someday some some will be able to do that, but for now it's going to be difficult. So John Oliver did a whole show on blockchain. And he picked up my analogy, and he had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> I quite enjoy it, actually. He says, uh, uh, well, you, you have to Google it. To, to, only he can can tell it. But he says, well, hold it. Well, that's well, that's a terrible. Sure. That's a terrible thought. If someone turned a chicken McNugget back into a chicken, that chicken would be fucked up. You know, he'd be suffering from PTSD. <laughs> and- <laughs> Writing haunting poetry about the experience, the things I saw. Buck, buck, buck off. My body is whole, but what of my soul? Anyway, it was quite a story. Yeah, that, is, that, that is so funny. So you were you were you were one of the definitive books called you know the blockchain revolution, and um, I think that you know we, we are in this 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 huge revolution and and there's some really interesting stuff it's a, not only is it just but blockchain is just the technology that's helping facilitate a whole lot of things right uh, we talk about the financial the financial space right we know with, with cryptocurrency but there's so many other areas that the blockchain impacts right you also have a new book called the supply chain revolution and how blockchain is 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 sort of transforming that so my question is is right now. So here we are. The the global supply chains have, in some cases, been disrupted by this whole COVID nineteen thing, right? How could blockchain maybe fix 
some of the things that we're experiencing with the supply chain so that we don't have those kind of hiccups in the future. And is, are we going to be sourcing more locally? Because it seems like we've gone to this globalist sort of thing. And now it seems like, you know, with all these nations being scared, maybe more, more nationalism and more local sort of sourcing of supply chain. What, what do you, I mean, the manufacturing coming back? I mean, a lot of yeah. stuff, a lot of stuff to unravel there. Well, I, there is. And that issue is sort of orthogonal to the whole issue of blockchain and supply chains. I mean, you know, I live in Canada and, and uh, President Trump said that 3M can't ship um, masks and ventilators to Canada. And so uh, you can bet that, uh, we've got, and I have no direct information on this, but you can bet that they're saying, well, we're, we're going to have to build our own indigenous uh, industry to be able to do that because we can't rely on others. 3M was pleading with uh, the president to not do that because they know that once companies build or countries build their own capability, they're going to have markets shut down. But but supply chain overall is a fifty trillion dollar industry, plus or minus. And uh, you know if you got it, it came from a supply chain. If you don't have it, it came from a, it didn't come from a, it, it came from a supply chain that was not functioning right. And you think about this current situation, the shortages. I mean. How can we have a shortage for toilet paper? Well, hoarding only comes when people lack transparency and they have fear. If you know that this supply chain is going to deliver toilet paper, you, there's no need for you to go buy three years supply, and you won't. And on on all of the um, uh, PPEs, the per, personal protective equipment, I mean, how can it be that we can't make get a paper mask manufactured? So the thing about blockchain is that it it's the new platform for supply chains. I think pretty much all supply chains will move to this platform because you think about it, you got all these different parties and manufacturers and components makers and sub manufacturers, and then you got planes and boats and plane trains and trucks, and then you got borders and escrow agents and immigration people and tax authorities, and you got all this information moving around through traditional ERP and you know EDI and and you got paper and inside a railway car, the, the way that they know what's inside the car is there's a little envelope in a box uh, above the door when you go into a railway car. So um, in a lot in a lot of cars. So imagine if all of that were a shared network state, you know, where you had a it was real time, where you had a single version of the truth, where you could have micro payments. You know, with the Internet of Things, light bulbs going on to auctions for power grids. Um, you know, a recent one I just saw is a guy who's building an app where you can source your power to make sure it's green. And the way it knows that is it knows the provenance of the electrons and where they came from. So someone says, yeah, we're green manufacturers. What? That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me how it works. But you try you know, you track the source of the electrons back to a coal plant <laughs> or something. So, um, again, this is the age of uh, transparency. Wow. So, um, I mean, this is a uh, th this is pretty exciting uh, stuff, and I think that there. Th it's funny you ask me that because uh, we're doing a lot of work now on uh, blockchain and public health, blockchain and pandemics, and and our work on supply chains is really exploding right now for exactly the reason that you raise, and and it's this pandemic. It's like a giant whack in the whack in the head, you know. That, that's causing us to rethink and re-examine all kinds of systems, institutions, even leaders. And, you know, I, I can't say that it's wrong to say anything positive can come out of this thing, but one of the results might be that we're being forced to look deeply at a lot of these old systems and ways of functioning and maybe rebuild them uh, for, for a whole new economy and a new uh, era of technology. You know, you talk about blockchain and pandemics. I see you've got a report here on the site at blockchainresearchinstitute.com. Can you share with us just a few of the findings and conclusions you've come to? Uh, you bet. So what we did is um, we uh, brought together about 35 leading thinkers in blockchain public health uh, from around the world. 
And uh, we held a big round table and then we launched a big research project. And uh, Alex and I uh, uh, wrote this uh, massive report. It's actually 25,000 words. It's quite a uh, tome. And uh, we came to the conclusion that there were five big areas. Um, one is just-in-time supply chain or asset chains, as we call them. And I, I just described that. But a second one has to do with data. Like the, the, the problems fighting the pandemic have a lot to do with data. And, and it's because data is probably the most important asset in fighting this stuff. And if useful data exists now, it's in institutional silos and a lot of areas it just doesn't exist. And, um, you know, we need to know everything about, about p infections and uh, people's movement and, and all kinds of stuff. So um, the solution here is a big one in our mind that everyone should have a self-sovereign healthcare record that's part of something much bigger, which is a self-sovereign identity. You know, you think about it, your personal uh, information, there's so much of it now. It's the virtual you, and it knows more about you than you do because you can't remember what you bought a year ago or what your heart rate was a year ago or what, you know, what medication you took a year ago, what diagnosis you had, what your temperature was. Uh, I don't remember what I had for dinner last night. I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, so, but, you know, what test scores you had. I mean, hundreds of classes of data. And we create this data, but we don't get to keep it. It's all expropriated from us by uh, large corporations mainly and also governments. And, um, you know, we're, to be a little hyperbolic, we ca we call it digital feudalism. You know, you work the land, you create this value, and the the landowner lets you keep a bit. Well, today we all create this data that constitutes our digital identities, um, but it gets taken away and we're left with a few cabbages. So, um, and this is not just about privacy, although it, privacy is a big one here. People say to me, well, Don, privacy is dead, get over it. This is stupidity. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. But it, there are other problems too. I mean, it means that we can't use this data to plan our lives or our health. We can't monetize the data. And this is behind the bifurcation of wealth that exists in society. And it's insecure. It's not secure because it's um, on central servers. And you guys know there are two types of those servers, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. So. Um, what if we could get all this data back, our identities back, and manage them responsibly? Well, think about the health component of that and how powerful uh, that would be. That, and, and a lot of this is related to all these wearables. It's measuring stuff like your heart rate. It could measure your temperature or whatever and your location. And that's part of your healthcare record. Now, you own it. but you could have, there could be proper incentive systems in society where you would release that data, personal data to appropriate clinicians and, uh, you know, epidemiologists. For sure, you're going to release it. If you come into a hospital, you're going to authorize any accredited clinician to access that data. And governments could even mandate in a time of national crisis, uh, we will tap into all these identities and get anonymized uh, aggregate data so we know what's happening. I mean, that would be an extraordinary weapon to fight against something uh, like a pandemic. Anyway, um, you got to read the report. I mean, we, we talk about the whole issue of money, and now is the time to move towards uh, fiat, uh, digital currencies. Uh, we talked about the idea of uh, frontline professionals who are the, really the heroes uh, of this whole thing. Um, that they can't get onboarded enough. There's no way of, of uh, 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 certifying their talent or understanding what kind of proper uh, credentials they have. And blockchain is a perfect platform for that. And the other thing that we talk about is new models uh, to reward responsible uh, behavior. You don't have to force people to do stuff if you provide proper incentive systems for them to do so. And for them to do understand that certain behaviors in their self-interest.
Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, Don. So I know you you've, you you had a lot of you had a lot of foresight throughout your entire career. Like you you really do seem to know where things are heading, and you're able to to put put words around it and to to help inspire people uh, to to move forward. And you've created this blockchain research institute, and which I think is very smart. And you've gotten a lot of amazing companies on board with the uh, the blockchain research institute and you you recently are, are, are launched a new program for 2020 around all these uh these what 100 plus projects on managing the transition to the second era of the digital age maybe talk a little bit about the blockchain research institute and its initiatives and maybe what is the second era of the digital age well, the the way we started off this conversation is I was describing that we've had an Internet of Information, and now we're getting a second era of the Internet, an Internet of Value, or anything of value from money, securities, whatever, the data in our identities or health records, um, can be managed, stored, transacted in a secure and private way. And where we achieve trust in society, not through a, an intermediary, but through cryptography and some clever code. And it turns out that that's really at the heart of the second era of the digital age, too. You know, I, I've, I've been around. I've witnessed this. Mainframes and mini computers, PCs, the Internet, the web, mobile web, social media, the cloud, big data. That was the first era. And now we have a second era where technology is infusing itself into everything, into the physical world, Billions, trillions of inert objects have become smart, communicating, and soon doing transactions. But also into our bodies, where we have technology that learns to do things that it wasn't programmed to do. AI, uh, drones, robotics. And to us, the foundation of all of this is, in fact, blockchain. This is the new transactional platform, the new operating system um, for the next uh, uh, decades ahead. So the second era, this is our mission at the Blockchain Research Institute, is to realize this new promise of this technology or of the digital economy, which is a, you know, a term that I coined over 25 years ago now. So, yeah, we've got like 60 faculty, a small team, um, 16 full-time people, uh, 70 of the world's uh, most important companies and a growing list of governments fund this work. And they each pay uh, between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand uh, dollars for these programs, and uh, we're doing one hundred and ten projects, creating three hundred and fifty research uh, deliverables. And um, when a company joins the BRI, it's pretty cool. You know, you pay one hundred fifty k, and you get many millions of dollars of value. You also get services, which include all kinds of online education and executive briefing anywhere in the world by right now online or through hologram uh, by me and uh, Alex Tapscott, my co-founder and uh, all and kinds of other son, stuff. Right. He, he's your boy. Yeah. Uh, he's my lad. Yep. Yeah. And, so he uh, went into the family business. I think that that's, uh, that's great. And of course he's developed a name for himself, um, you know, apart from dad, which I think is, is pretty special. Yeah. You guys are pretty much the think tank, right? When it comes to, well, we're the largest okay. independent think tank on this technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, as we're looking forward to the future here in the, the post COVID world, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about us getting back on our feet? Is this, are we headed for another great depression or are things slowly going to move back in place and, you know, we're not going to face that type of tragedy? Uh, well, again, I'm not a futurist, uh, but uh, I am a researcher. And um, I guess yeah, what's I'm, the data say? That's... I think it's a big problem. I mean, you know, the, the tech industry, we just saw in Toronto, one of the largest uh, uh, incubators. Uh, shut down. Uh, a lot of these uh, new technology innovation companies, entrepreneurs, they're they're in deep trouble. Uh, a lot of them won't come back. We're going to see the acceleration of some big changes, like around autonomous vehicles, uh, eliminating whole parts of the workforce. I think we'll see structural unemployment. I don't know if it's a depression. I don't know care what you call it, but we're going to have an economic, you know 
a real mess for a long time. And you throw that in with the all the global trade um, barriers now and protectionism and, you know, the kind of xenophobia that exists. Um, I got to tell you, I'm not very optimistic about that. Now, on the other hand, we do have this extraordinary new technology, but it's not technology that builds good economies or that solves social problems or, you know, um, global um, problems like climate change and so on. It's people. But the the way we described it in blockchain revolution is we said that, you know, the second era, I mean, once again, the, the technology genie has escaped from the bottle. And um, it was summoned by this anonymous person at this, uh, with uncertain motives at this very uncertain time in human history. And it's not going to solve our problems, but it gives us another kick at the can. And from that point of view, I'm I'm very optimistic. I mean, I think ultimately we're going to need a new social contract here in society. Uh, I actually drafted one uh, just as a straw person, if you like. It's a massive book-sized document. If you Google me and social contract for the uh, digital economy, or as I called it, the Declaration of Interdependence, uh, you can read it. But um, And I've given some talks on this too. But it, it's, it's a whole new kind of understanding about the way that things work in society, the nature of our institutions, and the relationships between us. Yeah, we're definitely entered into a, a new era, and there's there's not a lot of knowns. I mean, that's that's one of, that's one of the craziest things about it is people all never before have uh, th- that I can recall. You know, I mean, at least in my lifetime, where we've had something that's impacted literally everyone in the world for the most part, right? I mean, this is this is these are these are crazy times, and and hopefully some of this technology can help lead us out of this. Now, you you talked earlier about, you know, maybe the need for a universal basic income. And I want to ask about this because Microsoft recently had, they they filed a patent and it was for basically a, a, um, uh, an implant or some sort of, uh, you know, chip that you can have that can track your body's activity. And, and then based on whatever tasks it tells you, uh, to do, then you can earn cryptocurrency, sort of like using your body as a battery and earning mining crypto through activities. Now, I posted that out on Twitter, and we got a whole lot of people freaking out about that because, you know, one of the thoughts were, wow, well, maybe that's the deal where, you know, there's the universal basic income component. Well, but they can shut you off with that if you don't have your latest virus updates, uh, you know, mandated by who or whatever else. And that kind of gets into this whole sort of scary, slippery slope. Now, you know, have you done research on that new Microsoft patent yet? And and what are your thoughts about, you know, maybe universal basic income? And do you think it's going to be tied into some sort of mandatory system that connects your healthcare data with this? And you can't, you know, you, you could be shut off from your potential to earn money because that's what a lot of people are sort of thinking that could be, could be what's in the works. Well, Not if we drive hard towards a self-sovereign identity. Um, Mm. I'm going to say something I've never said before, but to me, the two big issues facing civilization going forward, uh, one is climate change, because we don't get to live on this planet if we destroy our our biosphere. Um, But the other is this notion of an identity that citizens own. Um, because data is this this powerful new asset class. How what are we going to do with it? How are we going to manage it? How do we protect our rights? And you know there are all kinds of views on this. Well, government should protect us. GDPR. I don't know. There's a role for that, but is that what we want? Uh, I remember Sheryl Sandberg at um, Davos was saying uh, once in a in a session. It was a public session, so I can quote this. Um, that, that Facebook was looking at making uh, user data available to the users. And um, they already do that uh, for commercial users. Um, but it made me wonder, is that all we need is access to some of our data? Why don't we own our data so we can make these choices? 
I saw an analysis recently that there are a billion and a half people in the world that if they could make their data available, um, it would be, it would double their annual income. Now, these are poor people, but um, there's an extraordinary opportunity here for wealth creation for individuals. But the key thing is you can't create some top-down government, you know, monolithic system because you're never going to deal with the fundamental issues. And it's not just privacy, it's ownership and monetization. It's the ability to use the data to plan your life and it's security and autonomy of the of the individual. Now, again, another book that I think my mom bought most of the copies of was a 1995 book I wrote on this topic. It was called Who Knows? Safeguarding Your Privacy in the Networked Age. Uh, in a network world. And, um, you know, people back then, it was like, huh? <laughs> I don't get it. What, well, Dom, really? I mean, you've written some good stuff, but you're kind of a little off on this one. <laughs> and, um, you know, anyway. So um, this this is a huge theme of my research and, and of our work at the Blockchain Research Institute is around how can we move towards a self-sovereign identity where we can get our identities back and manage them responsibly for our own benefit. Right. The goal is to empower people and not, not remove power. Um, Don, we really appreciate you finally joining us and coming on to share your, your thoughts with us today. Anybody can go to blockchain research Institute.org and uh, there's a lot of reports that you have available um, for free without being a member, right? That's right. And also, if, if I could mention uh, a couple of other things, um, the new book is called Supply Chain Revolution, it's, uh, edited with a forward by me. And um, we're publishing a book every quarter now. Um, two months ago, Alex Tapscott um, came out with The Financial Services Revolution. And that's a gorgeous book. It's available on Amazon. And our online courses are through Coursera. It's called blockchain in the enterprise. Those things have quintupled um, in the last in the last month, as a lot of people are sitting around at home wondering what to do with their time, rather than eating and drinking and talking to the dog. And uh, <laughs> once you've watched all of Netflix, maybe you might want to go online and take a course. And they're gorgeous courses. We we spent a million dollars developing them: two hundred fifty videos, two hundred fifty exams, and. Um, and at the end, you get certified. So there you go. Is that possible to have viewed all of Netflix? I mean, it just seems like it keeps going and going. <laughs> what yeah. What are you watching, Don? <laughs> you know, I just finished watching Babylon Berlin, um, three seasons. And it's about the Weimar Republic in the late 20, uh, 1920s. And you can see all these forces kind of coming together pre the rise of uh, of uh, Hitler and fascism. And uh, it's a fascinating, uh, dark, but really kind of uh, juicy uh, uh, description of this whole period. You know, it's not going to end happily, uh, although apparently there's another season that's coming up, but that's a real great one. Great stuff, Mr. Don Tapscott. Thank you so much for joining us here on, on bad crypto. So maybe where would you like people to connect with you? What is the most important thing that you want you with this course era or where should people connect online? Um, you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I, it's hard for me to interact with people there because um, I've got like 800,000 uh, friends or followers. Uh, Twitter. I'm at D Scott. That works. And uh, go go to the uh, blockchainresearchinstitute.org uh, website, and uh, you can uh, reach us through that and also get access to all kinds of stuff. Thank you again, Mr. Don Tapscott. You are welcome back in the Republic of Bad Cryptopia anytime. And I'm sure that now that we've got you know this relationship, that he will come back and, and update us. I think that he should be a regular uh, occurrence just like Mr. John McAfee is. Yeah. I'd love to find ways to see how we could add value to the Blockchain Research Institute because he's doing some amazing stuff over there. Mm-hmm. Love to find ways to, to help out with that. So, Mr. Joe Com, yesterday the having, having, and 
the hab the havening havened and you travened and we were live if you guys want to see the replay for the moment that that actually happened go to either the bad crypto podcast facebook page or the mastermind or any of the other places that we broadcast and you could see the celebratory moment that um that the block uh difficulty doubled yeah. and, and what we know really was really cool about that mr joe com was that? that you know after you and i had some chats for a bit then you put the zoom link in the mastermind group and then we had a few people come in live and had conversations with us and they got to share the happening with us see mm-hmm. we'll sometimes do this fun crazy zany stuff but you got to make sure you're part of the mastermind group to get part of that because if not you miss out on the crazy zany Oh, so crazy and zany the way those guys had a Zoom. That was <laughs> I know, so out of the ordinary. <laughs> Off the hook. But yeah, I do. I did like that. I enjoyed that. And I think um, that we'll probably do more spontaneous broadcasts that are live streamed um, in the future and invite those of you in the mastermind who happen to be there to come join us. So make sure you go to badco.in forward slash mastermind and join that group. Maybe, the newsletter, maybe what we could do is like we're about to spontaneously do something and then send out a blast in the newsletter because then I bet we could get we could get 100 people in there like that. If we're going to spontaneously combust. Yeah, if we're going to spontaneously do watch this. Travis and Joel spontaneously combust. What's it the price is of Bitcoin uh, right now, Mr. Joel Kahn. Well, it's May, about eighty nine hundred. May twelfth, uh, timestamp twelve fifteen Mountain Standard Time, eighty eight eighty right now. Around the having, wasn't it around eight? It was about eighty five hundred when the having finally happened. Right then, yeah, right. But but it, it was it sort of bumped up a little bit before that because it got down to what eighty. 8100 and then it went like the day before or something yeah and it went up to like 82 83 because that's what it does it goes in increments yeah so there's an article here on coin telegraph that came out just before uh, or actually actually just after the having um last night and it said bitcoin having tweets show investors remain bullish on the bitcoin price um investor sentiment remains bullish right now and you know honestly i'm expecting to see crypto go down again not a financial advisor my crystal ball's broken um i'm hodling because i am in the tim draper you know uh camp here that in the long term any profits that i would make right now are going to you know be dwarfed by a quarter million dollar bitcoin right. and so um I, you know i expect crypto goes up crypto goes down i'm really interested to see what is going to be the trigger point. What is going to be that thing that causes crypto to go parabolic again? For us to be in in that incredible uh, bull run yeah. sensation that we last had in late 2017. So Joff Paradise is one of the dudes who jumped on the call too, and he said that last time we had the having at the price of the having to the time that it hit the all time high, it went up what? What do you say, 29 x or something, or 26 x? Mm-hmm. And so to think about that, of what it is at eighty five hundred, if it goes another twenty, just another twenty x, right? So is that is that like a, a ten to twelve month? What was the time span that we looked at on those three I charts? About, I think I was like about twenty four months. Well, you think about it. No, it had been less than twenty four months because whenever it was in two thousand sixteen, where it halved, and then and then at the end of two thousand seventeen, so probably about fifteen to eighteen months. Well, yeah, because if it happened around May two thousand sixteen, right? Ish. Um, ish so may june 2016 it was you know by the time you and i really got into bitcoin it was around bitcoin was around a thousand twelve hundred when we started by the end of next year like some serious pops but by the end of next year at least all-time highs a lot of people are thinking we're going to have these all-time highs by the end of the year because the you know the printing presses are going and they're just printing out and printing out and printing out and the more money that gets printed out the more everything else gets inflated and then since bitcoin is deflationary in nature it's only going to increase in price because the volume or the amount of them stays the same so i mean it would look to me that 8500 9000 that's probably a bargain at this point there was uh, this is an interesting bit of trivia here in this article in coin telegraph apparently in the very first bitcoin block satoshi nakamoto embedded a message and the message was the times january 3rd 2009 chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks 
that was a message embedded in the first block as the 629,999th block was mined, F2 pool inserted this message, New York Times, April 9th, 2020, with 2.3 trillion injection, Fed's plan far exceeds 2008 rescue. So they gave a nod to the message that Satoshi embedded 11 years ago in uh, in that first block and i think you know look this is history in the making the you cannot look at the trends of what is happening with the amount of money that the fed is injecting the uh, collapse of various economies the devaluation of the dollar the increasing interest in bitcoin the the charts that show what has happened you know each time there's a having you can't ignore that and go oh well next t- this time it's going to be different the dollar is going to recover and crypto is going to go to zero and peter schiff is going to fart gold yeah yeah peter schiff is going to fart gold um well you know it's one of those things you more and more people now are understanding the value of crypto they may not understand how crypto works in the private keys but I think at this point, more and more people are starting to go, okay, well, Bitcoin's been around now for what, 12 years? It's not going away. Cryptocurrency's not going away. It's just a, it's just one of those things that people fight to learn. They, they don't really like change. People say they like change, but they really don't. And, and then you're looking at this and they're going, wait a second, I don't really understand it. So I don't really want to deal with it. Sort of like the internet for some people, like, mm, I don't really understand it. I don't want to deal with it yet. Kind of like the mobile phone and smartphones. People were like, eh, you know, grandma was out there. I don't really want one of those. I don't need one of those fan dangles. This phones. is like, why we have the, all. the technology adoption graph, right? Yeah. You've got your pioneers, then you have your early adopters, and then there's a reason they call it mass adoption, mm-hmm. right? Because that is when the majority of people go, oh, this is what we're doing now. Right. And it's a second nature. Uh, mm-hmm. but, you know, when when the OGs like uh, like Charlie Shrem and Brock Pierce and these these people got in, they were the true pioneers. I consider us early adopters, you know, maybe pioneering a different type of media and mm-hmm. podcasts back in 2017. Yeah. But I, I don't consider us a pioneer of crypto no. now. Now, maybe. 50 years from now with, you know, the perspective of time and Bitcoin is, you know, half a million or a million dollars or whatever, you'll be able to point back to the people that got in at a thousand or, you know, whatever and say they were Bitcoin pioneers, Mm -hmm. right? Because time compresses. Yeah. Uh, But with my getting in on Bitcoin in 2010, that was pioneerish, but I didn't have any other pioneer homies. So it's like, really, it's like, if you're by yourself, I'm just like, I, I, I was just, that was the that was the most frustrating thing is not having any crypto homies, and I think a lot of people have experienced it too. Because I was like, I was even talking to one of my friends from my hometown that I, that I remember chatting with him about it, and I was like, oh yeah, check out this crypto thing. I think it could be something. I don't know. What do you think? Hey, any anyone? Anybody? Bueller? Hello? Nobody? Well, I guess it's not anything. Okay. Well, hmm, interesting. You were a near pioneer. Like, yeah, you had the opportunity to pioneer. You were a near a near. I was pioneerly. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. I was yeah, because if you had run with it in some way and turned it into something, yeah, I probably would have never done a podcast. I would have probably been. I probably would be completely anonymous at this point and like super wealthy, living on a beach with my <clears throat> with a harem. Probably you would have sold it ten bucks. <laughs> And thought, you know, oh, I probably would have sold it a thousand bucks. I mean, oh close to it. when it was making that run, if you if you got that at, at like twenty five cents and it's a thousand bucks, you're an idiot for not selling. Really, you know what I mean? At least part of it, peel off some profits. Maybe not get rid of all of them, but like saves. I mean that that could have helped you coast for a while. Hmm. I, I would have guaranteed I would have sold pro- at least a third of them, if not h- half of them. If not, I mean, all, we, we've if interviewed you all of them. You could have bought back in at two hundred dollars in a few months. Well, we've talked to people on the show who got in for you know dollars, and and you know when it got to ten, they sold right because, <laughs> because that made sense. It was a ten x right, and and uh, of course you're going to take some profits because that's ridiculous, especially if you have thousands of these bitcoins. Right now, you're right. looking at real money to uh, to cash in there. Yeah. Wish I had thousands of bitcoins now. That would be a freaking amazing. 
Well, buy low, sell high, Mr. Travis, right? Buy low, true. sell high. You're a pioneerly in uh, pioneerly. So true. Yeah. Well, hey, everyone, we really appreciate y'all tuning in to Bad Crypto and listening to our after show banter. And oh, by the way, I want to mention something, Travis, because we, we talked about YouTube um, before and now, you know, library, which is the decentralized platform that is censorship proof. You cannot mm -hmm. be removed from library. Um, it used to be that you had to download the desktop application for your Mac or PC. It is now available uh, you're, you can share your links and people can view them on the web now. So this is a huge leap forward for decentralized video. And Bad Crypto now has a channel on library. All of the videos that you see on YouTube, you can also find on library.com, lbry.com. In fact, I've got a short link for you that will reward you and us with library tokens go to now this is not a bad co link this is actually a com link i've had a, a short link service of my own but we bad crypto will get credited with this it is com c-o-m-m dot u-s forward slash l-b-r-y that's how because library.com is l-b-r-y.com but go to com dot u-s forward slash l-b-r-y it's free Go sign up for a library. This is the future of decentralized video. And if YouTube ever does take our channel down, we have all of our videos. So up yours, Google. Mm. Yeah, but there, there, there are some benefits to being, you know, on YouTube. Sure. You know, you know go, go to subscribe to us there. Go subscribe to us on library as well. Could those, because those there's videos billions we put on people. YouTube will go to library. So just go connect with us. Yeah. All right, gang, we'll talk to you soon. Coming up next on Friday will be our bad news edition covering all the latest goings on from the crypto and blockchain world through the lens of badness. We'll catch you guys then. Please stay back. Who's bad? The Bad Crypto Podcast is a production of Bad Crypto, LLC. The content of the show, the videos, and the website is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any decisions as to finances, investing, trading, or anything else based on this information without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional financial advisor. Please understand that the trading of Bitcoin's and alternative cryptocurrencies have potential risks involved. Anyone wishing to invest in any of the currencies or tokens mentioned on this podcast should first seek their own independent professional financial advisor.